Looking for a new action camera? Then stay tuned to see our review of the new Osmo Action. Action cameras have been around for many years. Since the initial release of GoPro's Hero 3 back in 2012, they've been increasingly gaining in popularity in many venues from motorsports, athletics, outdoors, family vacations, you name it. And many companies have taken their own opportunities to throw their own hats into the ring, such as Sony, Olympus, TomTom, Yi, Drift, and many, many others including several of the uh, cheaper knockoffs, I should say, of the Hero 3 and 4 models. But now, the DJI, most notably known in the consumer markets for their drones, mobile gimbal, and in more recent years, the gimbal stabilized camera system, such as the Osmo Pocket and Osmo, now have released their own version of action camera, henceforth named the Osmo Action. So, I decided to pick one of these up, decide, see just how it fares compared to the rest of the market. Hmm. I wonder if this thing works. In the box we have the camera, obviously, a skeleton style mounting case with a GoPro style mount. Since the market is already flooded with GoPro mounts and adapters, this is a smart move by DJI to not reinvent the wheel. Next, a card with QR code to download the required DJI MIMO app for activation and remote viewing, mounting plate for curved surfaces and or helmets, one for flat surfaces or your bedroom headboard. Um, wrong kind of action. Mounting plate adapter to connect the case with the mounting plate. Battery case which has a spot for a spare micro SD card. One 13 milliamp hour battery which has slightly more electron girth than GoPro's 22 20 milliamp battery. An empty box, packing material, reference manual that you'll likely never read, and a USB-A to USB-C 3.0 cable to charge and transfer files with. When you first turn on the camera, you're presented with a QR code and instructions to download the DJI MIMO app for activation. You'll need to create a DJI account before downloading the app to be able to link up the camera and proceed with the activation process. Once you have that squared away, connecting to it requires the use of both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi on your smart device to communicate with the app. Once it establishes a link, you may begin the activation process to link the camera to your account and perform many future firmware updates. As of 5.16 of last month, there was a firmware update to a few existing features and addition of snapshot timers for stills. Selecting the Download New Firmware checkbox will ensure the app downloads any new firmware updates automatically. From my experience with the update process, the app had a few glitches from a version mismatch to a transfer error while the app tried to download the firmware to the new camera. Starting the process again, I was able to get the camera to successfully update. So it may take a few tries to get it going. After the firmware update, I was presented with the camera's video feed and access to the onboard settings. Navigating the camera's menu system is an intuitive carryover from our everyday smart device usage. The quick select button on the left hand side lets you choose commonly used modes. It can also be set up to access custom save settings profiles you create for settings you use in your everyday shooting. Holding in the quick select button for a few seconds will change the active screen from the rear to the front facing screen. You can also double tap the rear screen with two fingers to change viewing modes. The onboard image processor offers the ability to perform distortion correction of the fisheye effect common to all wide angle action cameras though this is only available from 4K 16x9 aspect ratio down to 1080p below 200 frames a second. 4K 4x3 and 720p don't have this option. There are two status indicators. 
one on the front and one on top to let you know at a quick glance what the camera is doing. Recording video, the camera does offer the ability to charge while shooting. However, you should probably pay attention to the reference manual. Yeah, that one. The little book that you've probably thrown away in the trash by now like many people do out of habit. If we scroll to page 5, you'll notice on line 18 that it states to not charge the battery immediately after use, allowing it to cool the room temperature before doing so. It also lists an environmental temperature rating from 41 degrees Fahrenheit to 104 degrees Fahrenheit for charging with warnings about leakage, overheating, and battery damage. Line 22 lists the battery's maximum safe temperature at 140 degrees Fahrenheit and ideal storage temps for maximum shelf life. Continuing on with the camera's literature, scrolling to page 4 of the operating manual shows a burn warning clearly stating to avoid touching any part immediately around the lens. So now all this doom and gloom in the manual has me a bit curious as to whether or not maybe the all metal construction of the lens cap has a bit of a different purpose than just cosmetic reasons. <sighs> Tasty. Enter FLIR's E75 Industrial Handheld Infrared Camera. This will be able to show the progression of heat buildup while the camera is recording over the duration of the test. I set up the Osmo Action in a room just shy of 79 degrees Fahrenheit, about 6.5 degrees warmer than the middle of their recommended battery storage range, not the actual operating temperature of the camera. The battery was charged to full and allowed to cool down for about an hour. The camera was then set to record with as many processing intensive options active to test a worst case thermal scenario. Over the next 20 minutes, the temperature managed to reach a blistering 156 degrees Fahrenheit on the ventilation area and a mildly more temperate temperature of 146 degrees Fahrenheit on the lens cap. Though the temperature didn't rise beyond that point the longer it ran on exposed parts, I can only make an educated guess that the thermal load was being dissipated by the processor heatsink and lens cap enough to not go beyond peak values observed. As a reference, third degree burns occur on most adults exposed to 150 degrees for 2 seconds and milder burns at 140 degrees Fahrenheit for 6 seconds. So the warning in the manual is well founded. The camera did eventually reach its thermal overload condition at 34 minutes 37 seconds, at which point the internal wireless radio turned off. Attempting to access the screen on the camera was also met with a high heat warning. However, the camera was still recording at this point. Recording was stopped and the battery ejected to take immediate thermal measurements. As you can see, the side facing the image sensor is a few degrees above the 140 mark, but an average of all four measurements yields a battery temp of 138.5. So what does this all mean exactly? Well, if you decide to use the camera in situations without adequate cooling, then you have to leave the camera within its frame and use either a hand grip or a mount to avoid being burned by the lens cap. Riding a motorcycle, you'll definitely have enough wind velocity to keep the camera cool. If you needed to, you could always put it in a clear container filled with water. It's also waterproof down to 36 feet. Why did I just spend the next several minutes talking about heat? Well, there's a... Called several manufacturers. Tends to wrap their components Lion. all in plastic. <laughs> and so... The thing... Tends to get a little hot. What? So... What? Oh. What did I did? And this is the first. Brought out that hotness with an all metal heat sink. Yeah. What 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 he said? I tried to source the Osmo Action's most direct competitor, GoPro's Hero 7 Black, via one of our local owners. But due to customer dissatisfaction, at the time I was unable to acquire one. So going down the list, I decided to pair it against something I already own, Sony's aging FDR X3000. Here's a few comparison clips of image detail in both their respective onboard graded and ungraded color modes.
and the DJI's HDR mode, though Rocksteady is currently not available while shooting in HDR. Next was a test of the stabilization along vertical acceleration, horizontal acceleration, high amplitude wobble, and shocks. Homogeneous direction changes favor the Sony, but when things get bumpier, the optical stabilization has a difficult time keeping up. One thing to note, there's a vast difference between optical stabilization and electronic image stabilization. That being, EIS uses zoom, roll, scaling, and perspective distortion to stabilize footage frame to frame, resulting in the scene being cropped around the edges. Optical stabilization does not have this cropping since the lens assembly itself moves to try and compensate for the instability, which does make it more susceptible to mechanical shock. In the case of DJI's Rock Steady, you lose 28% of the scene to stabilize the footage you're shooting. So if you can't afford to lose the edges, you may just want to stick to a gimbal. And some low light footage. So, the biggest question now is whether or not this will accept an external microphone for audio recording. Well, this as I'm talking to you now, is the audio on the DJI Osmo Action. So let's give a few a try. I purchased several generic 3.5 millimeter to USB-C adapters to try out on the Osmo Action. So this is the R-Tech. ACC guys, combo charging. This is the original USB-C to 3.5 millimeter adapter. Mass Carney. This is the essential. Unfortunately, none of them worked. While the Osmo Action is currently capable of only onboard audio at 48kHz AAC, 188 kilobits, the Sony has a dedicated 3.5mm jack and records in a lossless linear PCM format. Though, it does require the use of an attenuator as there is no manual adjustment on camera for the high gain built in. Time lapse on the Sony is limited to 1, 2, 5, 10, 30, and 60 second intervals, from 300 images, 600 images, 900 images, or up to a maximum of 40,000 images. The DJI offers a half second, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, 10, 13, 15, 20, and 30 second intervals from 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes, 1, 2, 3, 5 hour, or infinite durations. So time-lapse options are plentiful over the Sony. An impressive feature of the Osmo Action is its slow motion capability, offering double the frame rates at 1080p with a greater level of detail over the Sony. The Sony is capable of 240 frames, but only at 720p resolution. Finally, the Action's timed photo mode allows for longer duration intervals captured in full resolution photos in both RAW and JPEG formats. So here are my final thoughts on these two cameras. For image quality, the Osmo Action wins hands down with its 12 megapixel sensor over Sony's 8.2 megapixel sensor in both day and low light scenes. Overall, Video stabilization on the Osmo Action is also better at providing a more stable scene with the option to de-warp the fisheye effect in most cases on board instead of in post. Ease of use also goes to the Osmo Action for both its straightforward and quickly navigable menu system and onboard screens for framing shots. The Sony can only be viewed via a smart device app or a proprietary remote sold separately. Battery life on the Sony clocked in at an hour, 8 minutes, 21 seconds with Wi-Fi off, active stabilization on, and 4K 30 100 megabit per second shooting. The Osmo Action's battery life for the same resolution, frame rate, and stabilization enabled came in at an hour, 36 minutes, 49 seconds. 
Wi-Fi on the Osmo Action automatically turns off when the connection isn't in use whenever the display shuts down, so you don't have to manually disable it to save power. The audio category is a mixed street. The Osmo Action currently offers no external mic option, but has much better onboard audio than the Sony. However, the Sony has the capability to accept an external mic, if you can control the input level. And as an example, this is the audio on the Sony FDR-X3000. Now this is an audio test of the Sony ECM-CS3 microphone in my helmet, attenuated to 33%. Now this is an audio test of the Sony ECM-CS3 microphone in my helmet, attenuated to 33%. Though DJI is fairly regular on firmware updates with bug fixes and feature additions, so that may not be the case for terribly long. Look to a follow-up when that time comes. Water resistance again goes to the Osmo Action as it's rated for underwater submersion by itself compared to being just splash proof like the Sony. Though a light rain isn't likely to harm Sony's unit outside the case, but with the case it can reach depths down to 197 feet, but that's more a function of added hardware, not the device itself. Heat management goes to the Osmo Action with their integrated heat pipe design. The Sony has no way to get internally generated heat to the outside except through radiant means in demanding situations, so the likelihood of thermal shutdown is higher at critical moments. For overall functionality, I'd stick with the Osmo Action due to its increased options and similar shooting modes for settings and frame rates. The Osmo Action does lack a loop recording mode like the Sony, so if you had the inclination to use it as a dash cam, your options are limited to storage space. There is also a rather significant delay in its screen between what the camera sees and what's displayed on the screen while Rocksteady is active. This is likely due to the processing required. For our purposes though, being mounted to a motorcycle helmet this isn't an issue, but if you're trying to follow a subject, that will cause you some issues trying to keep the subject in frame. Between everything that's been mentioned, the removal lens filter and a form factor that's conducive to better aftermarket options, and access to mounting accessories already in use by GoPro by the thousands. I'd say the Osmo Action is well worth the investment. Sorry Sony, but I think it's time I put you out to pasture. Radiating. Thank <laughs> you.